Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Campbell Business Forum. Uh, my name is James McInerney from Assemblo, and I'll be uh, speaking with you today on the seven P's of marketing. I also like to acknowledge the Campbell Traders Association for putting on these events and also um, Dimmix Campbell for being a sponsor. Dimmix Campbell has an amazing new store located at 208 um, slash 210 Campbell Road in Hawthorne East, just a few doors up from the famous Riverly uh, Cinema as well. So, okay, so without further ado, um, I'll just jump into the presentation. Seven P's of marketing. Yes, yeah, so it was an idea that was created in the 60s by a man named Jerome McCarthy, which was originally um, actually only four P's, not seven P's. But then in the 1980s, a further three P's were added by um, some academics called uh, Bombs and Bitner, which is now more commonly referred to as either seven P's or the extended seven P's. Um, these seven P's are the pillars that make up the marketing mix which simply put is a combination of factors that can be controlled by a company to influence consumers to purchase its products. So, you know, quite simply, it's just like the things that you can control to promote your or influence your customers to buy your stuff, basically. Uh, and it's through these lenses, I guess, that's how you're able to, you know, approach your marketing in a scientific way. What are these P's? So there's seven of them, as we can see. So the first one is product, then price, promotion and place, they're the original four. And then the three that were added later is people, process and physical evidence. And these have been in place um, ever since. So they're, they're a methodology that works and has been um, flexible enough to uh, stand the test of time, even with additions such as social media and digital and things like that. So first one is product. So the product or service or um, experience, basically anything that you're selling should be the center of element of your marketing mix. So fundamentally, it allows you to address the questions um, key to uh, your sales conversions, for example, like what problem or issue does the product solve for the customers? Or why is your product the best one to solve it? The reason why this is so important enough for this first is because, you know, if you don't have something to sell, you're sort of dead in the water there. You need to have the thing first that you're gonna sell. What a lot of people tend to do, particularly small businesses when you're first starting out, they'll tend to focus on, I wanna start a business because it's something I already currently work in. So it might be an employee, for example. So they might say, I wanna start a supermarket because they work in a supermarket. Or they might wanna start a coffee shop because you know they go down to the local coffee shop regularly, they like it, it looks like a good job, you know, that sort of stuff. They haven't really thought about, do we need another coffee shop? You know, so they might want to have a coffee shop in their local area down the street. Do, do they need more? You know, does anybody want that product? Do they even know how to run that shop? You know, so there's problems with all of that. Um, equally with supermarket analogy, you, know, you may have worked in a supermarket, but you actually know how to run one. So it may seem like a good idea. You may think this is a good product you want to sell or a service, but if nobody wants it, then it's, um, it's not the right decision to make. So. At this stage, you should be looking at things like, you know, research. Uh, you should be trying to go into the area that you maybe want to open up this store, trying to see if there's the right type of traffic there, the right type of people you want to sell to. Maybe do some market research yourself, trying to work out if anybody wants this product. You know, what makes you better than the competition? If there is competition there, questions like that. So next we have price. The thing with price is the strategy behind the pricing of your product needs to be based on what your customers are prepared to pay and costs such as retail markup and manufacturing as well as other considerations have to come into it. But basically what we're looking at here is if the customer has to perceive it's good value for money, right? So often a business, I'll be like, oh, we need to make this a certain price because or we're being undercut by competitors and things like that. So often the, the argument seems to be that, oh, we need to make it cheaper or we need to beat the competitors and be cheaper. It's not always true. It'll just be, has to be seen that it's valuable in the customer's eyes. So a good example of this was there was a jewelry company who had made all these watches, rings, et cetera. And it was really high quality and it, cheap in the scheme of things, like really, really good, well-priced. You know, it was a great, great uh, product, but it was just, it was deceptionally, it was this cheap thing. So they just weren't selling. They were to a point they were gonna go bankrupt. And they were told by, you know, a liquidator to say, look, you know, just, just discount everything, sell everything, clear it out, and then just, you know, give up. Instead, um, the owner decided to double everything in price. So price is a quality indicator. So in this scenario, what happened was when they went back out to market, everything is people's perceptions now is, oh, that's expensive. Oh, that must be good quality. 
you know, that must be really good then. Then all of a sudden they started selling really well and, did, and, and succeeded. So the reason why I give that analogy, and that's an, ex, that's an extreme one, however, it's purely the price has had to be set as long as it's seen as valuable in the customer's eyes. So that's why it's really important to set that price correctly. Another good example is if someone opens up a coffee shop and you've got, um, you know, the regular cup price for a cup of coffee is you know, like $4 or whatever. And then someone decides to say, no, I'm going to have a coffee shop, I'm going to charge you know, nine dollars a cup of coffee. At first, you'd be like, "That's ridiculous! That's outrageous!" It might be possible if you could convey there was some value in there. So I don't know. You, you're serving gold milk or something. I don't know. But there has to be something there as long as the customers perceive it to be valuable. So that's why it's important at this point to get that price right. And that, and as I've said on the screen there, you, it, this could include things like membership discounting programs, email marketing promotions and sales. So anything to do with the price of your product or service. So next is promotion. With promotion, successful marketing strategies include all the promotional activities across the marketing mix, including advertising, direct marketing, and in-store promotional activities. The possibilities of digital promotion, however, are limited only by your imagination. So, and can include online events, chats, social media groups, and live streams such as this. The main point of that is your promotional activities, meaning there's the more than one. So regularly, I've heard particularly with small businesses, I heard someone speak at an event once and um, he was a you know business owner and had written a book and he was started to talk about marketing. It was only a small part of it, but he was just giving a little element of what he did. And one of the things he did was to say, I just tried one thing at a time and then until I worked out what worked. In his scenario, he, was, he went through a couple of things and then he got to letterbox drops. And he was like, letterbox drops will work for me. So when that started working, I just focused on that and only that. Now, the fundamental problem with that is that may have well worked for him, but he had no reason um, understanding about why. So you might say, okay, cool, that letterbox drops gone out to their home and it's selling whatever product he's selling. However, at the time, it may have been that it was really big in the press at the time. So people read it in the, in the newspaper and read it other ways and become educated about it. And then when they saw the letterbox drop come in, I went, oh, that's that thing. And then they bought from it. So there was other stuff going on that allowed that to happen. So adversely, eventually, um, if the letterbox drop all of a sudden stops working, it'll be like, oh, you know, we did do letterbox drops for a while and it worked, but that doesn't work anymore. So now we've moved on to something else. Once again, it could have been the letterbox drop stopped working for some other reason, you know? A good example of this is buying ads in the local newspaper. Originally, it was very few places you could promote yourself. So people bought, bought ads in the local newspaper and it would be very successful for them. But then as you know, media has been diluted across social media and digital and other platforms, that's worked less and less and less to, to the end point where, as you see, there's no really local newspapers anymore. To that end, it's sort of like you'd say, oh, that just means people don't want to read the news anymore. It just doesn't work. Well, that's not true. People do want to read the news. They're not, not necessarily reading them in that medium anymore. So that's why they no longer work. It's, you need to think of it as a promotional mix of activities. There's multiple things. It's not just one thing. But the main thing is in this part here is you need to be thinking long and hard about where your customers are and then what, what medium mediums they're going to be seen and how to get to them. This is one of the P's. So obviously this can be done by yourself. There's a lot of online learning or you could come to you know, a company like Assemblo, for example, to be able to help you with that. Place. So where and how your product is displayed and sold should be directly informed by your customers. A deep understanding of their purchasing patterns and targeting them at the right stage in their buying cycle will make it clear where you should promote and sell your products and how that fits into your online and real world marketing mix. So in a nutshell, your, your place is basically uh, like a physical store, for example, or your e-commerce site. So where the customers are coming and then buying from you. In retail, obviously, you know, understand this quite well. You've got a physical store. It's important to have it in the right location. It's important to have it well merchandised, looking nicely, all the rest of it. Now, it's important to look at what your competitors are doing or what your customers are doing in this space particularly. For example, you might say there's the main road, it's very busy, there's a huge amount of people there, so it seems logical to go, that's where we need to have the store. Now, it may be you can't afford the rent in that area. For example, there's nothing there that you can, you can get. So you have to go down a side street or down an alleyway or something like that. But if you're down there and the customers aren't walking past there, then it's important to know, okay, that's where my place is now, I need to, have wayfinding signs in the street or something to direct them down to that new area or you have to put more effort into promotional work in order to get them down to that area so it's very important to be aware of where you're placing this store M many a time i've heard people say oh i'm going to open up a new store i want to have it in this spot and i hear the conversation mainly being around 
it's physically the right size or it's the right rent or stuff like that, but it may just be in the worst location. It's like the product that you're selling just doesn't align with the people in that area, for example. So it's very, very important to, once again, to really think about your, your physical place here. A good way around this is to even, if you do think of an area and you think it's a good idea, once again, get as much data as you can. And my advice is if you can't, you know, afford to get some of your market research for you or something like that, one really good trick is just to go down there yourself and just sit down there for, you know, a couple of hours here, a couple of hours there, try and do it over a course of a week and just see who walks past the store. How many people are there? Obviously in times of COVID, this is, this is you know, not really a thing because no one's out and about, but generally you can get a good understanding over a course of a couple of weeks or so of who's going past, is there enough foot traffic, traffic going past how many of those people should you be able to entice into your store if it's merchandise well and all the rest of it? And that can then help you um, decide what do you think you can afford to pay for rent and, and get a budget. Also, uh, before I spoke about how the P's have um, evolved to take into account modern things like digital stuff and all the rest of it, a perfect example is your website. So before the place was just your physical store and a website was more of a when it first came to play it was more of a i referred to it sometimes as like a digital business card almost it was just like a little area of promotion it's like doing an ad websites have evolved into being as much if not more so uh, your store than your physical store but still to this day there is some you know physical store owners who will be like oh no it's, it's it doesn't work or i build a store i build a website and it doesn't work it's the same as the physical store so you might pay a huge amount of rent for a physical store a huge amount of money for fit outs all that sort of stuff but then they'll spend zero or very little on a website. Much like a website, you build it, you need to build it nicely. You need to make it, uh, build it so it loads well, all that sort of stuff. So think of building a store and you've, you've painted it nicely and you've merchandised it well. But once you've done all that, you do then need to do activities in order to get it in the right, in your customer's face. So like ranking organically well and things like that. That's like putting in the right place. As time's going on, it is starting to be more and more people are realizing that the website is as important, if not more so, than the physical store. However, it, it's, it's still, you know, there's a little bit of a way to go there. But my suggestion is you've got to view both those things as, as, as important as each, as each other. So next we have the people. So now we're on to the new, the new P's, as it were. What we've got here is excellent customer service, not only converts to sales, but can increase your customer base via referrals. Acquiring these referrals by people who love your brand can also be a great example of how your marketing efforts can support your sales process. It's important that everyone who represents your brand or deals with customers are trained sales professionals with an intimate knowledge of your product. What I'm trying to say here really is the amount of times you will do all sorts of marketing, whatever else, but then when it gets to someone on the floor, it all just falls apart. Um, it also gone the other way around as well. Um, I've seen some stores who have amazing customer service, but their marketing is terrible. So, you know, their message is is, is non-existent or, or, or very low level. And so no one even knows that they've got amazing, amazing customer service. But for this, this purpose, it can go the other way. So, you know, you might have a wonderful brand, you do great advertising, you do all this sort of stuff. I'm not going to name names, but there's a telco. I know that's <laughs> pretty bad for this. You've got great ads, all the rest of it. And then you go in there, and you, you know, you're just not served or you know, they, they won't come over to you, you're waiting around for ages, they're not helpful, that kind of stuff. So for all that other marketing that was done and all that messaging and branding and everything that's worked, the person in the store, who in the scheme of things is a very small cost in that whole process, lets the whole thing down. So that's why they're saying that the people is, should be a real focus um, and almost more of a marketing sort of element than anything else. So I mean, one way to think about it is anyone who is representing the brand or product, so anyone who's involved in any way, step of the way, really needs to be bought in and communicated to what the brand is and then conveying that, that same message. One one really good example of this, I will say, is so I've given you some bad examples, like you went to retail shops and it doesn't help you. One example was um, in America, there's a burger joint called in and out Burger. You know, it's, a, it's just a trashy kind of burger joint like anything else, but the service in there or the consistency of the service was amazing. Like we were on a, a tour and we just hopped off a bus and got funded in there as tourists do. And, they I just, just blew me away and I was like if, if McDonald's if they came out here and were competing directly against McDonald's even though their service is their, their product rather is just basic burgers chips you know their service was just next level so in that scenario all of a sudden what was acceptable for a McDonald's level of service for their people now is not good enough anymore so it would have to be raised up so this is an example of you really need to focus on this because either you're not 
doing what is uh, good enough for the market or if you are this is a good opportunity where maybe you can um, uh, raise up a level and um, uh, be more competitive so next is a process so on the new PZN. So the process of delivering your product to the consumer should be designed for maximum efficiency, reliability, but also include features that align with your brand, such as being environmentally or sustainably focused. And with the rise in online shopping, uh, digital partnerships and logistics have become an essential part of the marketing mix. Um, I'm sure we've all ordered something in our lockdown situations where it says two days or something like that and it's coming in two weeks or whatever. And I've laid um, Australia Post is being overloaded, so this is a good example of this. What we're mainly looking at here is it's effectively the customer journey. It's the whole process the customer's going from the beginning to the end of dealing with your um, your business effectively. Uh, from a retail point of view, this can be, I mean, you know, they, they come into your store. This is like one element of it, but let's just say they come into your store, um, they find what they want, they get to the register, no one serves them. So then they have to call out for someone, someone comes running over and goes, oh, okay, I guess I'll help you kind of thing. And then that person goes away. So in that little process there, it's broken. So it's just a matter of making sure that every step of the path for this customer, from the moment they hear about your brand, right through to when they purchase, right through to after they're purchased and they're, you know, the aftermarket side of things, and they're then talking to their, their friends about it. Yeah, they make sure that that is controlled all the way through and we're communicating it in a um, consistent manner. And very importantly, as I've said, that it's, um, you know, aligning with what our brand the brand is all about and the reason why the online shopping part is so important is because that is a part that's become uh, it's, it's a bit of out of our control in australia before covid our online or our delivery stuff wasn't of a huge level like overseas for example like in london you could order something from amazon re received in four hours we're not sort of we weren't there i think covid's actually picked us up a whole lot but it's like yeah this is an area that's out of our control once again, if we're focusing and looking through it, all our marketing with these, these P's lenses, we can then see this issue. We would come up across and say, yes, our, our process has a block at some point. How can we fix that? Otherwise you would be um, less aware of it, I guess. So last one, physical evidence. Your marketing mix must take into consideration all the things your customer sees, hears, sometimes even smells in relation to your product. What this, what physical evidence is doing really is it's the proof that your brand exists and the proof that a purchase took place at all, really, if you want to bring it at those two simple areas. So a proof, a proof of purchase, for example, is like receipts or invoices or something like that. And proof of brand existence can be like a website, physical store, business cards, etc. A good way to think of it is if someone comes to sell you on something one day, you might meet them at a coffee shop, they're chatting to you, they seem like a really nice person, they're, they're professional, they even give you a business card at the end. You're like, oh, they're great, they seem great. But of course, modern, modern, you know, modern day, what you do is you then look them up. You do a bit of online stalking. You'd say, okay, well, let's look at their website. Just say they didn't have a website. You'd be like, oh, it's a bit, a bit odd. And then you'd say, okay, well, let's look, look them up on LinkedIn. They're not on LinkedIn. You can't find them anywhere online. Now, they might be an amazing company. They might be just really old school. They've got a factory out somewhere and they've got a sales guy running around chatting to everyone with a business card. But for all intents and purposes, you just can't find them anywhere. So all of a sudden that's like lowering your uh, trust or faith in them, that they are something that exists. So it's very, very important to have this physical evidence there and actually have that physical evidence back up what you know the overall message is. And I know I've used that with my business uh, to great effect. When we first started this, um, you know, as, as all small businesses, when you first start, you're running around selling and you have a website and all that, but then my LinkedIn wasn't quite up to scratch. You know, this typical thing like marketing garbage and isn't necessarily doing all the things right themselves. But then the moment that we fixed up the LinkedIn and made that data line with what we're saying on the website, aligning with everything else, it, it was just like chalk and cheese. As soon as I'm talking to people, there's like this sense that they already kind of know you before you even go to meet with them. And that probably because they've looked you up, they've seen you online, they look around, they do all that sort of stuff. And that's what we do these days. So the physical evidence is a, is a really important sort of step there, which is um, particularly in the modern, in this modern, modern place. To summarize, as you can see, when it comes to creating a solid and strategic marketing mix, it's important to understand how the seven P's of marketing fit into the whole picture. Together with the seven P's of marketing form essential elements required to create a successful campaign. So further to that, what you're really trying to do with these seven P's is it's creating almost a, 
a scientific method, if you will, to run your marketing. So often when you meet with businesses that are struggling or often we get businesses come into us and, you know, often it's they're doing well and they just want to do even better. But regularly it's, you know, you get people who may be struggling a bit or got a bit of a problem and it'll be, oh, we need to do marketing. We need to promote, we need more sales. But if you actually, they don't quite know what's wrong. Whereas if you break it down into these, you know, looking at it through these seven Ps, you nearly always will find at least one of these is off or maybe a couple of them are off. A good example would be exactly like what's happened with COVID. So COVID's come in and, uh, you know, the unthinkables happen. Every single store's told they have to be shut. No one's allowed to do what they're meant to do for. I remember just before it happened, I was speaking to someone who worked at a real estate company owned a lot of retail businesses. And I was saying, oh, they're probably going to shut down all these stores. They're probably going to shut down Chadston. They're probably going to shut down these things. And it's like, oh, that would never happen. No, 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 no. It was like absolute disbelief. That would never happen. I mean, who would have thought we wouldn't have had the AFL or like grand final, for example. When that happens, all of a sudden, unthinkable's happened. So the place, the, the way you deal with customers has been removed. And it's like anyone who's been doing marketing up to this point and doing it through the seven Ps and actually taking data in and all the rest of it, you're now going to go, okay, well, we know who our customers are, right? We now know how we can engage with them because we can't physically engage with them, but we could, we can still have our e-commerce site or we have our website. Um, there may be people coming to the store still. So when they get to the store, what physical evidence so we can put up, you know, we put up some posters and stuff to say, hey, you can still deal with us online. This is the address. Uh, call this phone number and we'll get orders to you. We've got home delivery. So anyone who's aware of who the customers are and then they're looking at it through these lenses to go, what is the new landscape? They can then create a strategy relatively quickly to then be able to pivot and then be able to continue to trade and survive. And we've been seeing that through this last, you know, I've lost count now, but close to two years of you know, lockdown. Whereas the ones who didn't have any information it, they're still you know, paddling like crazy and working hard and getting there, but it's taking a lot longer because they're not sort of looking at it through this, through this lens. But then, the other thing can be literally maybe a competitor's come in um, and they're able to sell their things cheaper than you are. So all of a sudden your price is now wrong. Whereas you might just look at it generally and be like, oh no, it's, it's all these other things. Whereas if you've got these lenses you move through, then you can get to the answer much faster. The other thing too is you never want to look at any of these things in isolation. These things all work together. So much like you have a product, you, you, you can't really go to market without a product and a price and then a place where you can sell to people. It's much like you can't have a marketing mix if you're going to have um, elements in there that your customers can't engage with or channels that they don't, they don't have access to, for example, that equally won't work. So you need to be looking at this holistically. Yeah, so that's the end of my presentation. So as I said before, I'm got plenty of time here for questions. Okay, so here we've got one from Sharon Green. So I'm gonna read it out for everyone. So say you are a sole trader with a service-based business and you're working from home, perhaps place and physical evidence are less prominent in your marketing mix. What would you recommend here? Should these businesses double down on the other piece instead? Well, look, I would still say they are prominent because the physical evidence could be, you should, definitely should have a website. You definitely should have um, social media. So you should have your Facebook set up and you know, Instagram, depending on what you do, LinkedIn, that sort of stuff. So the physical evidence is still very important. Once again, people have physical stores. They often drop the ball by not having those other physical evidences. I think in that scenario, you should still be looking at them holistically as a group, personally. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, one person has <laughs> said, I want to set up a website. Can I do on my own? By all means, by all means. There's, there's, a, there's a rule of thumb when you first start you know, any kind of business endeavor called um, uh, MVP, so minimum viable product, so minimum viable product. Basically going, okay, if you think you've got a good idea and you should look at your, your business, so you shouldn't just be saying, hey, I want to set up a website, done, but you should be looking at your product to say, your business, whatever it may be. And then, yeah, set it up, just go as cheap as you possibly can. Like get a logo, put branding as cheap as you possibly can. There's like lots of websites that will do that. Um, you can do, there's sites that you can set up for free like with Wix and other things like that as well. Eventually when your business starts growing uh, and then if you want to be competitive with a website and you, like another company has hired somebody like us, for example, like Sembolo, we're going to beat you hands down every time. However, when you first start, absolutely set up a website for yourself. You can do it for free, but it's more you want to test to see if you can make money from that. And if you can make money from that, then you can go, okay, cool, now we can then we can start to grow rather than spending a lot of money up front and then being like, oh, this business is actually isn't working. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do anything out of that. Now, can you get benefit from hiring an um, expert to advise you on things? Absolutely. And we have clients from 
startups where we help them initially with their branding and their positioning and stuff like that um right through to you know multinational businesses it just really depends but yes you can set up a website yourself but like anything it depends on uh where you want to spend your time really so you know like i said i i don't do everything in my business i hire people to help me with elements that i could i could teach myself but yeah gotta work focus on where you put your energy so got another question can you suggest some people who do websites and how much should be the starting price um uh, well you know obviously you can suggest there's a whole lot of people but i mean you know it's like i've already mentioned some right there there's like there's like squarespace and wix and things like that you can set up yourself uh, in terms of building other websites, I mean, the, my own company builds websites. Uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not really, I haven't got a whole list of names I'm going to be able to give you in terms of building websites, but there's like a lot of companies out there who build websites for you. In terms of how much you should spend on it, that really comes down to what you want to do. Like there's different uh, websites, not a website, not a website, as I always say. Um, a lot of the time people are even turning away from calling it a website per se, because there's many different things. It depends what it's trying to do. If you're just literally wanting a digital, you know, business card, so you just want something up that just literally someone goes to it. So as a salesperson, you're walking around, you might talk to them about, the, about their business. For example, that analogy I gave where I spoke to a guy, gives me his business card and he had no website. In that scenario, maybe he does. And I'm only going to look at it because it's on his card. So the only traffic being driven to that side is this guy's physical effort, I guess. In that scenario, it's set up purely so it's giving physical evidence to me that he exists, his business exists. So in that scenario, he could set one up himself. Now, in terms of how good the design is if he did it himself, I don't know. I mean, there's templates out there, there's things like that. But that's all that's really doing is literally just being like a digital business card. It's just going to back up what he's doing. Now, if you want to have a site that's an e-commerce site, for example, it's going to sell a whole lot of products for you um that's going to be you know a different thing again like once again you can set up shopify and things like that but again that might be it only does as well as how much effort you do to send business there so you might need to be peddling like 10 men trying to do advertising to send it to that site um versus one that we would build where you'd rank really well you know over time it would work well in search engine optimization sort of scenarios um you know it works better with advertising it's more custom made as well so really it's how long is a piece of string. So, I mean, to answer your question, um, so I'm going to name there. So, the, um, uh, my answer to that would be, it's not a straight, simple conversation. It's not like, hey, it could be anywhere between zero and it could be $100,000. It really depends on what, what you're trying to achieve. So, my advice would be, again, you'd look at, you want to do a bit of a marketing plan yourself. Look at things to do seven Ps, look at what you're trying to sell, your service or your product or whatever, um, make sure it's viable. And then you can then ascertain budgets from that. E equally, it's like saying, uh, how much should I pay for rent for a retail shop? It really depends where. If some places charge $200,000 a year for rent, some places charge $35,000. It really depends on the location, how good it is, how big it is, all those sort of things. So that's a bigger question. Sorry, any other questions? James, can I perhaps jump in as Kerry sure. Daly here? Sure. Um, and, and just ask how this all, you've given a lot of examples around um, retail and certainly you, you've implied that that also is relevant to a service-based business because product is also a service, is a product. Um, but could you perhaps just give some examples how in a service-based business that might be tweaked a little bit, um, how you apply those seven Ps? Um, okay, well, my business being a marketing agency is a service-based business, for example. So actually, no, a, better, a better example I might give is um, accounting, accounting firm is a, is a good one. So if you look at the seven Ps, there are seven different things there, right? So obviously it's a, it's a product firstly. So what is their service? Well, they, let's just say basic, it's basic accounting services. So you could say, yes, people do want accounting services, sure. So you could say that's, that's fine. Um, uh, that can change, obviously, but at the moment you just look at that and see what are you offering? Is there something unique that you're offering? Is it some unique kind of, um, like why would they choose you over somebody else? For example, you'd have to have that that conversation. So it may be, I wanna start an accounting firm and there's this massive new client who's willing to jump and work, you know, I'm an accountant already and they're willing to work for me if I start my own business, something like that, right? Uh, it may be that you have some unique way of doing what you do so you could, 
you can make it way faster. So if people came to me to do their tax returns, they'd get their tax return done, you know, same day or something like that. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but yeah, that's one once one way. In terms of the price, you would then look at it and say, okay, cool, can we be, you know, is there an opportunity there to be cheaper than everybody else? Is there some way I can be more efficient and I can act, you know, be faster so I can charge less sort of thing? Or, or are we willing to offer a lot better quality, for example? So maybe you have a really nice, um, location so people see the value as you better so they rock up and maybe you offer them you know coffee and have this beautiful experience so this actually this is a good question because it's showing how the peas all interact with each other all right so on the surface you might say well what price should i be charging and it needs to be this price because that's what the that's what the market charges at the moment it can't be any more than that but if you take into account that your your people and your process and your place, so maybe you have a really nice office in a really nice area, and when they come into that, so the process when they come in, it's a beautiful building, and it's it almost feels like going into a fancy hotel. You know, they walk through the the reception. The receptionist is lovely, so the people are great. They sit you down. It's this great process. Um, and then, so in that scenario, maybe you're willing to pay twice as much for this accountant because this accountant is the best accountant. This accountant is better than anyone else. Now, I know that's a very dry example, but um, we all do this. I mean, half the time you'd be willing to pay way more for a luxury car a lot of the time, not necessarily because it's the car is amazing. It's also all the process around that. We have friends who work in some um, uh, luxury car brands. I'm not going to say which ones again, but some high level luxury car brands. And a big part of it is all the service around it. It's like being part of that club. So, and that's then adding value to the customer. So the price is in their mind. So yeah so the example i'm trying to say here is you've got to look at it through these seven p's lenses and how they all interact with each other that's where you should do every single time so i mean my own business as well like what when we do when we do it it's like making sure that all those parts all link up so what i have with these business cards for example it's a physical business card but it seems very old school but i'm quite proud of that card because it's like this solid you know edge painted beautiful card is this hard weird shaped thing that every single time i hand that to people everyone comments on that card there was like wow that's amazing that's really interesting so it's this like a quality sort of indicates they meet me hopefully i present well i'm nice and i'm friendly i get in this car they go well it's amazing they look it up online that business that website then backs up what they looked up it lines with that um, if I'm doing my things right, once they go to the website and then they go off into the into the world, we can track them and keep serving them ads. So that's the promotional element side of things. I, I would say, Kerry, that even uh, with service-based businesses, it's even more important a lot of the time because a physical business, it's like, you know, you set up a physical shop in a, in a busy place where there's all these people going past and it's, it's, it's more of a known, I think a more common kind of thing to know what to do, I guess. Whereas with service-based, a lot of the time it's, You've got to get out there and sell it's just you've just got to get out there and sell now i remember when i first started this agency it was initially it was told regularly that our oh, agencies don't market themselves they don't they don't just don't do that it's all about b2b type stuff and we've proven that marketing ourselves as an agency like marketing an agency which is very very hard to market to marketing managers because that's who our client base largely is it's very hard to market them um quite resistant to ads and things but we've proven that it does work so yeah I think I've hopefully answered that question. Okay, well, thanks everyone for taking the time to listen to me. Um, uh, for anyone who is interested, this has been recorded um, and will be posted on the Campbell Business website, which is campbellbusiness.com.au. Uh, also, anyone who has any questions that were not answered today, uh, feel free to send them to um, to myself. So at a hello at assembler.com and I'd be happy to answer them for you. So uh, have a great night and I look forward to seeing you all at the next Campbell Business Forum, hopefully in person. Thank you.